few weeks ago I was approached by some international communists or groups of communists internationally organized to ask whether I was willing to collaborate with them and I, I said I would be provided that there was a definable program that they held as their objectives. So we've had discussions on this and these are some suggestions I am making as to what a communist program should be today. Essentially, I'm going to present you the background, the documents that I've used, then I'll go through an outline program. The founding documents obviously have to be those that Marx and Engels wrote in the 1840s, the Principles of Communism by Engels, the Manifesto of the Communist Party, and the demands of the Communist Party in Germany, all in the late 1840s. Then there's a second round of relevant documents. Um, there's the Civil War in France by Marx, the Critique of the Gotha Programme by him. Then there are the Erfurt and Bo Bolshevik Party programmes of the late 19th, early 20th century. And there's Lenin's State and Revolution. Things have happened since then, obviously. Uh, the most significant being that people have experienced the dead end of parliamentary strategy as a way of moving to socialism. And this was something which, obviously, the Erfurt program still had some faith in. Engels had some faith in it applied to Holland or Britain in the 1890s. And Stalin in the early 1950s in his exchanges with Pollitt um, also thought that it was a viable course of action in Britain. I, I find that a doubtful proposition. The, since then there's also been the experience of socialism's rise and fall in Eastern Europe obviously and we now have the environmental crisis brought about by capitalist industry. These are new things since all these documents were drafted. So we have to ask what remains valid. Now I think the basic structure is probably good. If you look at all these old programs they all have an introductory section saying what the nature of capitalism is and what the current situation is. Well current situation over a long period, not the immediate conjuncture, but the current situation in the country that they're operating in. So, how would you start it off? Well, you start off with talking about the need for political organisation. The development of exchange has established such close ties between all the peoples of the world that the liberation movement of the working classes must become international in character. The capitalist class organises internationally, in multinational firms, in trade organisations like the World Trade Organisation and the European Union, and in military alliances like NATO. Unless the working people in every country are organised in political parties, and unless these parties ally themselves together, they will be unable to overcome the united forces of capital. Improvement in technology, which means increased productivity of labour and growth in social wealth, results in a capitalist society in greater social inequality, in a widening gap between the haves and have-nots, and an increase in the precariousness of existence, in unemployment and many kinds of deprivation for ever wider sections of working people. The exponential growth of capitalist industry and large-scale agribusiness are destroying the environment in which we live. Seas are overfished, forests turned to desert, and the atmosphere polluted. Global warming threatens to make large parts of the tropics uninhabitable, to ruin the yields of the most fertile agricultural areas, and flood many of the world's great cities. But as all these contradictions which are inherent in capitalist society grow and develop, so also grows the discontent of the working people and the masses with the prevailing order of things. The numbers of the world proletariat increases 
and the struggle between the proletariat and the exploiters intensifies. At the same time, the improvement in science and technology has created the material conditions for replacing capitalist production relations with communist ones, replacing exploitation with cooperation, and the replacement of environmental destruction with a conscious planned life of harmony with nature. Now, all the early stuff also talked about socialists and communists. And this is important because we mustn't assume that all socialists are communists. So Marx and Engels describe types of socialists. They start off with reactionary socialists. These are people who can conclude from the evils of existing capitalist society that traditional patriarchal society must be restored. In one way or another, all their proposals are directed to this end. The reactionary socialists, for all their pretend sympathy for the working classes, really act in the interests of the old order. In China, they are the revivalists, in Russia, the Duganists, and in the West, National Socialists and Greens. The bourgeois socialists are adherents of capitalist society who have been frightened for its future by the evils to which it necessarily gives rise. To this end, they propose mere welfare measures while seeking to maintain intact the system of private exploitation. Examples are the old Socialist International, the so-called Democratic Socialists in China, the followers of Senator Saunders in the USA, Podemos in Spain, etc. And then there are the classical Social Democrats, or what Engels called the Democratic Socialists. They are a category of Socialists who favour some of the same measures as the Communists, but not as part of a transition to Communism, however, but as measures which they believe will be sufficient in themselves to abolish the misery and evils of present-day society. And most importantly, they accept the existing constitutional order. Examples would be the Com Communist Party of India Marxist, the Eclectic Marxist School in China, and Die Linke in Germany. Now, what in contra contrast to that is communism? What do communists want? Under communist society, all forces of production will be taken, as well as the distribution of products, will be taken out of the hands of private capitalists. And will, they will be managed in accordance with a plan based on environmental sustainability and the needs of the whole society. In this way, the evil consequences of capitalism will be abolished. By the use of digital technology, the flow of goods throughout society can be rationally controlled and monitored to minimise human effort, to maximise social satisfaction and to stay within the limits set by nature. There will be no more commercial crises. Instead of generating poverty alongside plenty, production will assure the satisfaction of the vital needs of all and it will create new cultural needs and at the same time the means of satisfying these needs. The, it'll be the end of money economy. The buying and selling of commodities will end. Within the communist system, the producers don't exchange their products. Just as little does the labour employed on the products appear here as the price of the products. Since now, in contrast to capitalist society, individual labour is a directly a component of total social labour. An individual worker gets back from society, after deductions have been made, exactly what she gives to society. What she's given is her individual quantum of labour. For example, the social working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labour time of the individual worker is part of the social working day contributed by her and her share in it. She receives a digital or paper certificate from society that she furnished such and such an amount of labour. After deducting her labour for the common funds, and with this certificate, she draws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labour cost. The same amount of labour which she gives to society in one form, she receives back in another. 
and rather than having money prices, goods in the communal stores are marked with the number of hours of social work that went into them. Now, those are the economic objectives. What about the political objectives? The state rose with the development of private property. Throughout the ages, its outward form varied, at one time monarchic, at another aristocratic or republican. But at all times, its purpose was to secure the property of the wealthy, who were few, from the many who were poor. The communists hold that the first stage in the overthrow of class exploitation is to win the battle for democracy and to raise the workers to the position of ruling class. To do this, though, the workers can't simply lay hold of the existing state machine as it exists, since this state is designed for the rich to rule over the poor. Instead, they must smash each branch of the existing state machine, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary and the army. In every capitalist country, whether it styles itself a kingdom like Spain, Japan or Britain, or a republic like Brazil, India and France, legislation is approved by a parliament. These parliaments are the supposedly democratic elements of their nations. A parliament claims to represent the people. But in fact, parliaments are totally unrepresentative, overwhelmingly composed of professional men and women, several steps removed from the conditions of the life of those they claim to represent, and they're ever eager to advance their own fortunes by putting themselves at the service of the rich. The working people can only rule once the old parliaments have been dispersed and replaced by direct democracy at least the following constitutional measures would be required. You require a power of popular initiative and veto, such that on the collection of sufficient signatures, a referendum be held to enact a new law or strike down an existing law. There has to be direct popular voting on the annual budget and taxes. Such popular assemblies, assemblies as the nation may need for lesser legislation must be drawn by lot from the mass of the people. They must serve relatively short terms and their members must be paid more, no more than average wages. This is to prevent the rise of a class of professional politicians. In all, next is justice. In all capitalist ca nations, the courts are presided over by judges. Judges are highly paid and they're drawn from the upper classes. The one democratic judicial element, and this is present in only in some nations, is the jury. In many courts, these upper class judges are the sole deciding body. This is especially the case in what are called supreme courts, which are in many nations able to overrule the decisions of elected bodies or dispose, depose popular leaders. As with, as such, the judges represent another pillar of upper-class rule. To replace this, we need a system where the working people can only obtain justice once all the courts are jury courts, with proceedings chaired by a juror chosen from among the jury themselves. Appeal courts should have larger juries than courts of first instance. Legal counsel must be provided free to all accused or any plaintiff seeking redress from a public body. There must be compensation for any individuals unjustly accused, imprisoned or sentenced, and there should be an ab abolition of capital punishment. Political power rests ultimately on force. States maintain standing armies, not only to prosecute wars against their neighbours, but also to put down internal threats to the power of the rich. The communists call for the abolition of the professional standing army and its replacement by a popular militia. There should be a universal obligation on young people 
to perform initial military training. All physically fit citizens must subsequently be liable for militia service. Local territorial militia should elect their commanders. All adult citizens to be responsible for keeping their service rifles secure and in good order at home. It's important that the service rifles be disseminated because we know that the workers' militias in East Germany and Hungary were easily disarmed in 1989 because the arsenals were centralised. The professional soldiery should be restricted to a core of trainers, general staff and technicians. People will require special skills like aircraft pilots, etc. Powers of arrest and law enforcement patrols should be lodged with the citizens' militia rather than the professional police force. Professional policewomen and men should be restricted to detective and forensic services. Now, what are the transitional measures that would be required? Not to get to communism initially, but the immediate measures that would be required to establish socialism. Firstly, steeply graduated income and property taxes and the abolition of indirect taxation. And to say the abolition of taxes on articles of consumption which fall most heavily on the poor. There should be nationalisation of land and the rent of land should be paid to the local community to defray local costs, local social costs. There must be a prohibition of urban landlordism. Landlords should be given three months to sell their properties which would otherwise revert to the community. Rent on publicly owned houses should not exceed 15% of average income. All internet monopolies must pass into public control, supervised by committees drawn at random from the population. There should be an abolition of all internet censorship except for pornography. There should be an abolition of all laws which limit or suppress the free expression of opinion and restrict or suppress the right of association and assembly. These are rights which have been won in the past but which are being increasingly infringed on. All basic infrastructure should be publicly owned. Energy generation and distribution, telecommunication, roads and railways, bus services, airlines and airports. Alongside this, all carbon intensive industries, for example steel, concrete, brick production, should be brought into public ownership. The public sector should be run according to a plan that will transition the economy to zero fossil fuel use in the shortest possible time. There must be a separation of church from state and abolition of all expenditures from public funds for ecclesiastical or religious purposes. That includes obviously having secular education. Money and credit should be in the hands of a state through a national bank with state capital and all private banks and bankers should be suppressed. There should be a cancellation of all debts other than tax debts or debts of banks to their depositors not exceeding two years ab average wage. That is to say if you have a deposit with the banks, savings in the bank, up to two years wages that is money the bank owes you and that should be protected. But if someone has got a, uh, a million or a billion pounds in the bank that's a debt of the bank to the, p the person that disappears. Pensionable age should be 60 for both sexes. The state must take over the pension liabilities of private pension schemes and pensions should be paid out of income tax. There must be a general suppression of exploitation. The legal rights of shareholders to the value produced by workers should be abolished. Workers in private firms should collectively appropriate the value they add. All company and boards should be appointed by employees and the working week should be limited to 35 hours. Should be secularisation of schools. Education should be free. Educational materials should be free. There should be free meals in the public schools. For higher education, the, there should be no fees and accommodation and maintenance should be provided to those who by, main, by virtue of their abilities are able to pass the entrance exams. 
There should be free medical care, including midwifery and medicines, free burial, one year parental leave at full pay for each child to be split between mother and father as they choose. From what I'm able to gather, the OIC who contacted me were initially established in Latin America and largely have strength there. Now, of course, at the moment, Latin America is the one area of the world where left-wing politics can be said to be advancing. Till now, they're largely based in Spanish and Portuguese-speaking areas as a result but they are appealing for participation by organisations and individuals around the world and you can see on the screen there their um, website which you can use to contact them.